Okay, I hope this is working. Um, cool. So good morning or good evening or good whatever time of day, wherever it is, where you are. Um, my name is Felix, I'm a postdoc at University of Tokyo. So for me, it's evening. Um, and we're kicking off this meeting with, or this OCNS meeting with this um, batch tutorial. Um, this is my first time doing a online tutorial like that. So if I am blabbering away and not making any sense, please stop me. If anything at all is going wrong, let me know. And we'll, we'll try to fix it. Okay. I've got a bunch of slides, um, but the idea is very much that this is a hands-on tutorial. So the idea is that you guys, so I've, I've made the slides vertical and I'm sharing it vertical. I think, that, I hope that's arriving as intended. And the idea is that you have space for the slides on one side and maybe the chat on the other side. And in the middle, you have the uh, terminal and you run commands in that terminal. And yeah, so um, really the best. So what I'm going to try to, to give you in this workshop is, like a feeling for how to deal with bash, how to work with it, um, give you some tricks, um, give you an opportunity to, to make yourself comfortable in the command line. So I'm going to be in introducing some of the basic concepts of how to use a command line and some of the basic commands that you might come across, you might need, you probably quite often need. And I'm going to include some things that you probably wouldn't find. So I've only started, so I've started using Bash maybe about 10 years ago or so, or using Linux in general. And I'm almost entirely self-taught, so there are lots of things that I don't know, but over the years I've accrued some, some um, skills and knowledge. But some of the things that I'm teaching you, I've only just learned for this tutorial because they're not command related. So there are things like looking back in, in your command history, et cetera, that you wouldn't usually find when you're looking for help online on Stack Overflow or whatever, you won't find, find these sorts of things. So I've tried to put in lots of these things just to sort of give you a, a, a solid working basis. And yeah, I think with more or less, um, with what I'm getting started with anyway, um, you'll be able to deal within or, or operate within a Unix or a Linux environment uh, to, to some extent. Right? And again, to say that the idea is that you guys try things. I, I'm going to throw lots of commands at you that um, you can do. You can do other things as well. Just yeah, play around, figure out things. So with that, let's start with a very basic caution. So if you're used to, uh, to Windows, you might be used to Windows asking you all sorts of questions. Is it okay if I do this? Is it okay if I do that? Etc. Bash doesn't do that. So the one thing that Bash will do is it will interpret your command and it will execute it. So whatever you write on the command line will happen, well, assuming it's well formed. And that includes commands that can be dangerous to your system in some sense, some way or another, that can delete data. So things to be aware of, for example, if you delete something from the command line, there's no recycling bin. Those files are gone. There are ways to get it back, but it gets complicated. So best not to delete, to delete things that you don't want deleted. And um, so with that in mind, you know, don't just copy a random command from the internet without knowing what it is. I'm going to try to, well, I, I don't have any commands in in the presentation that um, are dangerous, but in the right sort of context, you might well find things that are harmful in, in some ways. I'm saying be extra careful with sudo. I don't actually introduce sudo, but just know that if there, so for example, um, things that are system relevant, are not your own files, they're root owned files, and you can delete them, 
but you have to do it with sudo so that you get asked for your password and then you can delete them. No problem, except then your system's gone, potentially. So be careful. Okay, first contact. I assume that you already have a terminal open and I'm going to assume that you can write in that. So you can try a few of those things that I've got on, on this slide. So you can echo things, for example. So you can echo a string and that string comes back at you. You can ask who you are. So who am I is a command that uh, perfectly harmless. Um, just returns your username. There is pwd, which is the present working directory. That just tells you where you are right now. You might notice that, assuming you've started in in a in a brand new login shell, your pwd includes your username. So your who am I and your PWD return partly the same thing. Then other things you can do is looking around. So seeing what files are present in the directory you are, that's ls. So note that's an L, not a one, or not a big I either. Totally safe things include prefacing anything on the command line with a hash. So anything with a, with a hash in front of it is treated as a comment and doesn't do anything. So that's an exceptionally safe thing to do, I should say. And then final, very safe thing to do is to print exit or type exit. By the way, I haven't said this, but obviously after any command you hit enter and that executes the command, All right? If you exit, you're now left without a shell, so you open it. Instead of writing exit, you can also do control D, which drops you out of the current shell. Something you can try is from within a shell, you run bash. So then you're uh, running a shell within the shell and you can exit from that, which leaves you back in the base shell that you were in. Another safe thing to do when you're typing a long line, for example, and don't want to execute it, instead of going backspace, 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 all the way back to the start, you can do control C that cancels things. You might notice something about that. We'll get back to that. How to copy things works a little differently in a shell. Now, before we dive into any sorts of commands, I want to cover a couple of basics on, on sort of how to even operate that shell. You might have noticed that it's not entirely straightforward. It's not always quite the same sorts of key bindings as you're used to. So things that might be different, uh, home and end should probably work, but if they don't try control A and control E instead. Control left and right to skip by a word should work, but if they don't, try Alt B and Alt F. So for back and forward. Then if you've got a long ish command entered in the line, you can put your cursor somewhere in the middle, press Control X and Control X again, and you get to the start of the line. And then you can do it again and you get back to where you were. Now, seems minorly useful. 
um, I'll just point out that the start of the line is not fixed as such. Technically, it's you have two cursor positions. So you could be doing things like hack away at the start of the line, xx to the end of the line, and then jump around between places like that. There's one thing that will come up in in more detail later, but I'll, I just want to mention it now. If you've executed a command and you want to do the same thing again, you press up or you press, so you can press up and down to sort of cycle through the, the history of commands that you've executed previously. If up, down don't work, control P and control N will do this trick. Just to point out, if you want to refer back to these things, I've uploaded the slides on the SCED, so you can grab them from there and, and refer back to these. Okay, now you're in a command line, but you can use the mouse, assuming you're not on some sort of terminal station where you don't have a user interface, you still have a mouse. So you can do things like highlighting a command from previously. So if you scroll up a bit, you, you highlight something that you um, executed previously. And you might try Control C to copy it, but obviously that doesn't work because Control C means cancel. And Control V also doesn't mean insert like you might be used to. So what I do instead is I use uh, mouse wheel. So basically the middle mouse button has an maybe unusual function if you're not used to it. So you can highlight anything. It sort of pastes that thing into not quite the clipboard, but it kind of acts like a clipboard. And then with middle click, you can, you can drop it in again. On Linux, this works pretty much anywhere. So you can do that even outside of the um, command line, but I'm, as far as I'm aware, this doesn't work anywhere else in, in Windows, but it should work within the, the Git shell or, or the um, uh, WSL instance that you're running. Another way to insert is, well, to sort of control V is shift insert. Shift insert actually does access, at least I believe so, it accesses the actual clipboard. So if you control C something from somewhere else, from a website or something, and then shift insert should insert that as well. I'm saying caution line breaks means execute because if you highlight an entire line, including the end of the line, so the line break, so the, the entire rest of the line is highlighted, that includes the line break. So that means if you paste that in, it will execute immediately. Can be handy if you're trying to repeat a command. You don't need to press enter as well if you get the right length of string. Moving on still with how to work with a command line, how to edit a command line. Control and backspace might not work. This is one that I've only very recently figured out how to, how to deal with that. I've, for years and years, I've written commands, made typos, went tick, 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 all the way back. Yeah, there are better ways. There's alt backspace or esc backspace, so escape and backspace. By the way, that's alt and backspace or escape and then backspace. Um, I don't think I'm referring to it much, but it certainly is referred to elsewhere as well. So like in uh, manual pages and, and help um, documents and such. Um, these two ways of accessing like key binding key commands are referred to as M. So it's like the meta key sequence. 
So with Alt Backspace or M Backspace, you can delete to the left. Oh, good to know, okay. Wait. Sorry, I'm just responding to something in the chat here. On Mac control, command C and command V work for copy and paste. What does, so how do you cancel? Is that control C? Not familiar with, with Mac. Yeah, to cancel on a Mac, you can use control C. Yeah, and okay. control left and right moves between my desktops instead of doing that stuff, but the oh. command does some things, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so some of that might be, not entirely applicable for Mac. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> a little bit different on Mac, some of these. But... Yeah. Okay. But yeah, so. Right there. I, th I think, yeah, Control W should do that. That's right. Anyway, so you can delete words to the left. Um, so backspace properly with Alt backspace and with Alt D you delete to the right. So like actually, at least in my experience, uh, control and delete, which is what I normally use in like text editors, etc., also works. So yeah, find out what works and yeah, use whatever is comfortable, right? Then, you can delete an entire line or when you're in the middle of it, you can delete the left side of the line or the left side from the cursor to the start or from the cursor to the end with Control U to the left and Control K to the right. And I'm being a bit, a slight bit disingenuous because delete technically is not the right term here. It actually, most of these commands do something like kind of like pasting so yet another sort of clipboard that isn't exactly the clipboard. But once you've deleted something like that, you can put it back in with control Y. It's yank. So you can actually collect a few things into that paste buffer and then it sort of gloms it all together and puts it back with control Y. I think it's order dependent. Not entirely sure, sorry. Nope, apparently not. Never mind. <laughs> okay, moving on and getting to the first couple of commands. Um, so we've already seen both of these, PWD for print working directory and LS. Joe, does that also have a, a, a long name? I, I think of it as lists, but I'm not. Yeah, I just, sure. I just refer to it as list. I don't know if it stands right. for something fancy, list something. I don't know. I guess. <laughs> anyway, what it does is it lists whatever's here where here is your present working directory if you don't have any arguments, or it lists whatever's there. So if you ls and some path, you get whatever's in that path. So if you're still in your home directory, ls documents should show your documents. Note that on Linux Unix systems, things are case sensitive. So, LS capital D documents is not the same thing as LS little d documents. You can try some flags. So these are kind of like modifiers for the command. So with LS minus L, you get a more detailed listing of what's happening or what's around you. There's a bunch of columns in there. 
including uh, it's all that um, file modes. So who's allowed to read, write, and execute? Also D at the start there for it's a directory. Um, I don't know what the second column is. Third and fourth are owner and group. So who owns the document? Fourth column, oh, fifth column, size. Then when it's last been updated, I think by default. And then the file name or directory name, whatever it is. You might notice that the size of documents or files or directories is not particularly readable. These are bytes. So if you want them in a bit more readable format, you do ls minus l minus h. Or you can con concatenate the short flags, so ls minus lh, to get a better idea of how big your files are. Yeah, the other flag I use a lot is dash a to see hidden hidden files and folders. Getting to that. Thank you. You can sort the output of, of what's coming out of particularly less minus uh, minus L, I guess, is the usual or the, the, the useful one where you want to be sorting. So S is by size, capital S. T by time. And I'll let you figure out what R does. Best. Maybe um, combine it with one of the other sort options. See what happens. We notice that you can command uh, combine all those flags. So instead of doing dash L dash H dash R, you can do dash L H R all in one. And I'll get to a bit more detail on how that works later. Okay, so so far you've maybe presumably been stuck in your home directory. You can go elsewhere with CD, which is, I think, change directory. <laughs> you can go elsewhere. So you've just listed your folders in your home directory. You know what folders there are. So you can go CD documents, for example, or CD whatever. You can do absolute paths instead of CD and a path without a slash in front of it. You can do cd slash home slash your username slash whatever. And whenever you're use, you're dealing with paths, that sort of that same sort of pattern comes up again. So prefixing something with slash means start at the root. And really root means the root of the entire file system. So anything that's anything in Linux like including real files that are actually on disk, including a lot of other things that are in RAM, but masquerade as files because everything is a file in Linux. Everything is at, at, in some way um, ties back down to the root. Which also means that if you start manipulating things at the root, you're playing with fire. So it's fine to look, but if you're if you're writing or changing or moving or deleting things from the root, then uh, caution. There are ways if you've been moving around a bit, presumably, you 
you might want to go home. The, the bare CD without any arguments brings you right straight back to home. So back to your user folder. You can also do CD and tilde. Tilde is uh, directly expanded, I think, before the command is executed. I'm not entirely sure. Um, anyway, it turns into slash home slash username, so or whatever the home directory happens to be. Um, so you can use it for, let's say, for example, you can, if you're somewhere else and you want to access your documents folder, you can do ls tilde slash documents, and that shows you what's in your documents, even if you're in some other folder. CD has one step undo functions. So you can do CD minus and you get back to where you were previously, but that only works once. So once you're back where you were previously, where you were previously is where you just were. So it doesn't go back. Like it's not a stack where you remove things. It's just you put in the next uh, place where you were. So you can flip between two directories with CD minus. Titled this next one interlude, but really it's still basics, very much so. But I, I, I feel this is something that you must know, otherwise you're going to be spending way more time in the command line than you otherwise, or than you really should. So if you go back home, so CD, and then type ls and start with something that you know exists, and then type tab or just push the, the tab button you get a completion of, well, if you've already started with something that's unique, it just completes. And if you've started with something like just capital D little O, you might have multiple options like documents and downloads. You can double tap and you get the list of all the things that are available for completion. So you can do stepwise, if you know something starts with a D or something, double tap and find the next, like, like uh, type a little bit more and then tap again. So ways to make your life a bit easier, I think. There are some commands where this also works for like subcommands. So usually it, it it always works for or always should work for things that are in the present location or path things. There are also commands where subcommands will uh, tab complete. So this afternoon when you're working with Git, you might find that some of the longer commands you can start writing the subcommand and then tap and it might complete, if I'm not mistaken. But that depends from command to, to command, so something to something worth trying. Sort of hitting tap for me is part of muscle memory. It's something I, I do whether it works or not. And if it doesn't work well, then I keep typing. Okay. I'm assuming you're back in your home directory or if you're not, go there. You can make directories. So you know, start building up some, some uh, a few files and directories um, in a subfolder. I'm gonna call it for 
the purpose of this, the slides, call it bash tutorial. You can call it whatever you want. If you make dir, so make a directory that creates this directory. Assuming it doesn't already exist, of course. You can make multiple directories in one command. So if you, oh, sorry, I should say, go there as in go there into your bash tutorial folder because you don't want to clutter your home directory with lots of stuff. And then you can do make dear one, two, three, which makes you one, two, three as directories. Next one, make dear with minus p or dash p is um, make the entire path. Actually, I think it means parents, but anyway. So if you were to try just make dear something slash something else, and something doesn't already exist, then make their complaints because it can't find something. So if you want to make an entire directory tree, you can do that with dash p. And just some refresher for, for ls and tab completion. So when you've made some of those directories, see what, what's there, see if you can tap complete. If you start with lsf and you've got your foo bar bas tree, then try lsf tab and tab again and tab again because the completion is unique, you step right through. Hidden things. So if you start a directory name with a dot or a file name with a dot, that means you won't be able to see it. So if it ls just so, things with a, that, that start with a dot are not visible. So as ls min I say that Joe mentioned before, which shows you everything. And try that for your home directory. So look at ls minus a tilde. Do you find a lot of stuff that you might not have known is there? Some of it is related to, well, most of it is related to configurations of some sort. So your software, including bash itself, has configuration files or puts configuration files in dot config or other dot prefixed stuff in home directory because they're configuration specific to you, to your user, I guess. And, but they're not really so useful that they should be shown in the file explorer, for example, or when you're just looking for for normal files, so they're hidden with dot. Assuming you know they're there, you can still go into them with cd or show them with ls and dot config, for example. There are two special entries if you do ls minus little a, which are dot, which is this directory, and double dot which is the parent directory. So like where you came from. So if you're in your um, uh, bash tutorial folder and you ls double dot, then you're showing home because your bash tutorial folder is presumably nested within your home directory. And because those dot and double dot are everywhere, every directory has a dot and a double dot, there's a command or a way to not show that, 
just LS minus capital A. It's kind of up to you to figure out whether it's worth the extra keystroke for shift and A, or whether it's not worth it to, to hide the dot and double dot. They do technically act as directories, those two. So you can do things like ls dot slash something, and that just includes the current directory slash whatever. Means you can also remove them if you want to. Although you can't remove the current directory from within the current directory, that's a different story. Okay, I've mentioned that you can undo where you're, you've been going with ls minus. There's a facility within bash that lets you do that in a more organized way, but I struggle to find all that much use for it. So if you're in the tutorial folder, you've presumably got the folders that we created at the start with one, two, and three. So you can push D1 from the tutorial folder, you get two effects. So the first effect is you enter the directory one, and the second effect is that the current directory, as well as the previous directory, are now in some sort of stack. So you can add a, add a few more things to those to the stack. So if you push the double dot slash two, so parent folder from one and the sec, uh, number two folder, you now have three things in the stack. If you just do push D from there without arguments, you flip between the two last entries. Might sound familiar. So that's like CD minus all over again. But you've got a stack. So now you've got three things, or if you've already skipped ahead to push the three, maybe four things even. You can show DIRS, which sort of interfaces directly with push the pop the. That shows you the list of directories that you've, you're currently working with. And it sort of acts like a, well, a rotatable stack, I guess. So whatever's on the left of that list is where you're currently at. And if you do just a bare push D, the next one on the on the list, so the second one from the left, uh, is is activated and the, the, the top two are, are uh, exchanged. But you can flip the stack a bit farther. So you can do a push D plus two or minus one or Up to you to figure out how that exactly works. Give it a try. There's nothing you can break there. Places where this might be useful is like you're working in different directories at the same time and you're moving back and forth between them. It can be useful to have sort of a to not have to go CD and then the absolute path or CD and some long relative path. And then push the and pop the instead. So just for com completeness. So if you've got a stack of that like that built up and you don't need the top directory anymore, the one that you're currently in, then you can pop the and you drop back to the last. So it has the same effect as just bare push the but it also drops the previous the, the directory you were currently in. So I believe it should also always print the directories that you've got in the stack whenever you use push to your property. But in doubt, you can always use stairs to get the list back, see where you're at.
one potentially interesting thing there is if you have two directories or three directories in the stack and you're in some place, you can CD, so you can change directory without using PushD. And then if you do a bare, bare PushD, you just go back to the previous thing in the stack and what goes into the next, also, now then previous thing in the stack is where you currently were. So you can sort of subtly change the stack with moving around. Okay, so if we're back in bash tutorial, the root folder of this, if you echo something, say echo cow, you just get that cow back thrown at you as an output of that echo command. What you can do with that is you can write that output to a file. So any commands that produces output, you can do that, that right pointing caret and put a file name there. And whatever is coming out of that, the, the command on the left will be redirected into that file. So if you would be so kind to echo cow and ghost into moo text and boo text, respectively, I have some plans with that later. But obviously you can also do other things. Best to try lots of stuff. You can show what's in a file with cat. So cat Muda text gives you the command the sorry, the contents of no should be cow. Might be more. Usually on its own, so with a single redirection, so a single right pointing pointy brace, you overwrite whatever is in that file. So that's one of the things that you can do great damage with if you're not being careful. What you can do instead is do a double redirection. So right pointing carrot, right pointing carrot, which appends instead of overwriting. So if you echo bull, double redirect mu text, you then, well, see for yourself, check what's in the file. By the way, no cheating and opening a, a, a graphical text editor. <laughs> The one way you're allowed to cheat in this context is use a command line text editor. I haven't put anything in of that in the presentation. I probably should have. So there's um, VI, which I don't recommend unless you're uh, willing to get stuck. Um, I think most of, uh, certainly most Linuxes, and I'm pretty sure the the newest Git shell as well um, comes with nano. So nano should, <laughs> yeah, not Emacs either. Nano, I use nano. <laughs> nano is, is friendly to people who haven't grown up with VI and, and Emacs, I guess. So there's that. To get out of nano is a relatively simple matter. You just control X, as is noted at the bottom of the editor. So we've already used cat, which stands for concatenate. So technically you can cat multiple files and it just puts all of the contents of all those files into the standard output. 
So if you do cat mood at text at the moment, you should be catching cow and bull, I think. Or maybe whatever else you edited in, but it doesn't require an, uh, an argument, incidentally, so you can cat whatever comes from standard input. It means if you do cat and then nothing and enter, you just get concatenated back at you whatever you've put in. So whatever you're typing in comes back at you. And that serves as a reminder that control C is use useful to cancel. So you can drop out of a, an existing command that's running with control C, usually. Unless the command is being misbehaved, control C should always do its best to cancel. If you cat bear and then redirect to a file, you can now write into that file with a very, very, very minimal text or, or editing interface, as in whatever you write and hit enter on ends up in the file. So if you do that and then cancel out, you can check that. You might have now something in your meowt.txt file. Probably not the most useful use case for cat, but has its uses for, for demonstration purposes. More useful, obviously, as I've mentioned, cat is for concatenating things. So if you cat and multiple file names, you get all the contents from all those file names as one long list. Interlude, because I'm thinking maybe you're tired of typing. Globbing. Um, this is about finding files or, well, I guess, listing files that you don't want to name explicitly. So there are two things in there that I haven't known, didn't know before very recently. But the star is obviously the, the asterisk. So anything. So an asterisk matches anything, or well, one zero or more characters. I think. Is that right? Is it zero or one? Zero. Okay. So you can do things like show all files that end with a certain string, or all files that start with a certain string, or all files that include a certain string. I don't think I did that right. Well, anyway, you get the idea, I think. Question mark matches exactly one character. So you have a, if you have a moo.txt and a boo.txt, then replacing that M and the, or B with a question mark, ls question mark oo.txt gives you all things that start with exactly one character and then go ooh the text. If you want to be specific, you can use square braces and list the exact characters that you're looking for. So if you're going square braces M, B, square braces closed, ooh, then that gives you anything that starts with moo or with boo, but nothing else. which is a segue into naming files and things to do or not to do. So you can, in general, within Unix Linux environment, use almost anything as a file name, including special characters, including just about anything other than slash and dot, I think. So obviously dot and double dot, I think, are reserved file names, although I'm not entirely sure come to think of it. Yeah. But 
with all that freedom comes also um, caution. I mean, obviously you don't want to be using all sorts of characters that have other meanings within Bash or within other tools that you might be using. In particular, I would caution against using space as a part part of a file name you can do. So if you run that command echo dog redirect it into now you have to quote to even make that work. Bow space wow dot txt. You can do that. But then if you don't quote it, that won't work. If you try to show it, so with ls tap completion will do things for you. But if you don't tap complete, you do either have to escape the space, so with a backslash in front of it, or quote the whole file name. And some scripts or softwares might not have thought of that and might break if you have file names, particularly in, in paths, so directory names as well, that have spaces in them, or have other things in them that needs to be escaped. So in general, I would stick to alphanumeric a dot to, as, a, as a sort of file type um, separator, although you don't need it in Linux. Linux doesn't, doesn't really care about file name endings except for some special cases. And then you might have noticed that ls does some sorting of, of its outputs. It's not just completely random. So Vanor, by default, ls sorts lexicographically, so alphabetically, but if you have a file underscore one dot whatever, and you continue that pattern and you get to file underscore 10, then that will be the next file. If you list the whole thing, ls, all those files, you'll have file one, file 10, file two. It's a bit uncomfortable. So if you plan a bit ahead and think, well, I might have tens of files or hundreds of files with the same prefix and postfix, let's do some zeros. So things stay nicely in order. And I'd say, be tab completion friendly in the sense of if you're naming your files consistently and you're doing some sort of, I call it root to leaves ordering. So start with the big concept names first and then do like, like I'm showing with, with file underscore something. If you do it that way around, then it's relatively easy to tap complete in uh, sort of to, to fill in parts and then you just have to type the bits that are actually specific to the exact file. I see what you're saying and that's yeah that's cool if you were to list the number first underscore file then tab completion would just find a bunch of numbers this way you tab complete the file and then you got zero through 100 or whatever nice right yeah Okay, back to doing some things, some things. You can move things around. So if you're back in the tutorial folder, you can move one folder into a different folder. So if you can MV3 into two or two into one, you now have a tree of one slash two slash three, presumably, if you did it in that order. Couple of things to try on this slide, just for for practice. Make a new directory. Move all your text files into that directory. You notice that you can MV argument 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 argument, and what happens is all the first ones are actual arguments, and the last one is the target. You can also do is move to rename. So the other, the only way really to 
rename a file on, from bash is to use move. So yeah, as Anker mentioned in chat, the best way to circumvent spaces is underscore or dash maybe. So I would move that bow wow with a space in it into something more sensible. Other thing you can do is copy. So if you make another directory with animal sounds, that probably doesn't include ghosts. And go to the silly sounds directory. Remember how to do that. Small prints there. And then you copy with CP. And the format is basically CP, again, like move, argument, 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 all the sources to target. Usually, probably what we'll be doing is moving files to a directory, in which case target is a directory. If target is a file name or doesn't exist as a directory, it'll be treated as a file name. Then you can only have one source. So that's one of the things where Bash won't just clobber everything you're trying to pile on top of each other. So you can absolutely clobber stuff if you copy something onto something else that already exists, that will get rid of the previously existing something else. But if you try to copy multiple sources onto the same file name target, then that won't work. Sometimes it's a little bit friendlier than, than you might expect. But in general, things will not ask for permission. I've mentioned that before at the start. The basic idea is if you're writing a command and hitting enter on it, again, the understanding is that you know what you're doing and Bash will happily do it. So things like, like MV and CP, move and copy, things like redirection, they won't ask if there's already a file there that exists and it's going to be overwritten. If you have access to it, write access, then it will be overwritten. And there's no getting things back in an easy way. If you remove or certainly when you overwrite it, it's like, yeah, pretty much forget it. Um, there are some arcane ways of getting files back that you've deleted or, or otherwise destroyed, but I would not recommend getting into that position. Speaking of removing things, so you can remove files with RM. You can try to remove directories. So rm and some directory name is going to throw an error because that doesn't work. You can also try to remove directories with the specific command for removing directories, which is rmdir. And unless the directory is empty, that's not going to work either. So if you want to remove directories and you want to be sure that you're safe, use rmdir. If you've got an entire directory tree that you want to delete, you can do that with minus P, just like make there. You can remove the whole tree in one go. 
I say re restore the tree, by the way, as uh, not an option. You can't restore things, but just re recreate it. Actually, I'm not sure I'm using it later. But anyway, it's good practice anyway. Joe has an excellent comment in the chat about manipulating files and backing them up before. Safe thing to do. If you don't know that you're going to be safe, do some backups. You know how to copy now, you know how to move, how to rename. So what you can do when, you, you, when you've messed up, you can just move it back. And that automatically then overrides the messed up part. So do it the right way around. Move source target, not move target source. Just say. You can actually remove directories with RM, but I would not advise it unless you know what you're doing. So RM minus R does recursive remove. But if you have stuff in that directory, there will be no warning and it will all be gone, including any files, of course, not just nested directories. Shaders commented earlier in chat, sudo rm minus rf. Even just without a sudo, you can remove the entire contents of your own directory is also not advisable. So yeah, minus F for RM. I didn't put it on the slide because I figured that's a dangerous one. I'd rather not, but yeah, F is force. So don't ask any questions. Sometimes, sometimes Bash does ask questions, but yeah. Good tip from Anchor. I didn't know about that one. RM minus I. Now before we go into the break, how to get help. So unless you're on Windows and you've only got the Git bash installed, all of these should get you something with regards to whatever command you're looking for help for. So in preparing for this tutorial, I've lose, used a lot of man, whatever. Man stands for manual. I've used a lot of help, whatever, because some things particularly um, bash commands, so things that aren't technically executables from from the Linux or GNU system, but rather our bash built-ins don't have a man page, so they might have a help page instead. The difference is that with help, you just get it printed out. With man, you're in a manual environment. We'll get to what that looks or how to how to deal with that sort of environment after the after the break. There's info. So some commands are so uh, well documented, shall we say, that there's uh, half a book which isn't in the man pages. And instead there's the extended version of the manual in info. And then there's apropos, which gives you a list of all the man pages where things are written about whatever you're apropoing about, which includes commands, but that's also for things like um, system files that might be mentioned. For example, um, if you've done any um, work with mounting stuff, uh, FS tab or M tab, for example, there might be entries related to that, so we'll find those with apropos. 
And then for individual commands, often there's going to be a dash H or a double dash help flag to, well, give you a basic idea of what the command does. And also, of course, if you do something wrong with the command, it doesn't run and it'll throw some sort of help at you. You might just try, I mean, depending on the command, but some commands you can just type the raw command without any arguments and it requires arguments, let's say, then you get a, a short help about how to use it. I've put some links here to um, review. So this is online material that you can use. So the slash bash, there is the manual pages online. So for most of the Linux or sort of core commands, if you don't have it because you're in git bash, you can go online instead. Anchor post, posted a link for a different man page host. Anyway. And then if you're, well, I presented some key, uh, some key bindings at the start, but if you want to revise those uh, syntax links, there is quite useful, I think. Okay. With that, I think we'll take a brief break and reconvene at, let's say, oh, <laughs> at half past. I was about to say 10.30, which is not the time for most of you. So whatever hour, 30 minutes is where we start. Yeah, so in about 15 minutes, we'll reconvene. Yep. Right. Sounds good. In um, the Sorry, if there are any questions, put them in the chat and so we can start the next session on those. Yeah. Because we haven't had any questions yet. And yeah, so as I said, with said, there's a ton of information about how to use it, and uh, it might take you a couple of hours to read through everything. I don't recommend it. It's one of those things where you use it some, and you find the limitations at some point of of what you know, and then maybe you f figure out maybe there's a way to make something a bit more complex work, and then use search through the manual or through the info pages and search for specific things that you're trying to do. And it's sort of like a muscle that you're training. And of course, instead of looking into the actual manual or info pages, you can always ask Google and see if somebody has done something similar and adapts patterns from usually Stack Overflow or wherever else. Always with the usual caution, if you don't know what a flag does, maybe look that one up first. If you don't know what a command does, etc. Bunch of good question, Anchor. I don't know.
I'm just trying to figure out how I'd check that rather than reading it just by trying, but I'm drawing a blank right now. Anyway, as noted, regular expressions is a bit of a, well, a, a tutorial of its own, or maybe two. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna add too much detail to that. There's a bunch of comments in, in the chat to help you get going with that. And um, yeah, other things, look them up, try them out, see what works. So from the previous slide there, this, this, this monster with the two dash E's, if you can, so I, I hope you figured out what that does. Hope you've managed to, to get that going. So the idea was cut out the, the base name of the command. So just a command without its arguments out of history, right? What I'm doing here is I'm telling you, okay, you can use sort. So that sorts by default alphabetically. It'll just print whatever it gets in, in sorted order. But sort has a lot of options that you can go through. So another case of looking at the man page, figuring out what you need, figuring out how to do it trying it. And then just to add to that, so now you've got the sorted output from the history filtered, sorted, then you can pipe that into unique with unique minus C, so unique just without flags, just gets you unique lines. So because it's sorted, they're all nicely arranged. You won't have any doubles with unique, right? From uh, duplicates. So with dash C, you get the count for each one. So you can see what you've recently been doing, numbered by how many times you've done it. Again, Unique has other options. I'm not hugely familiar with it, so I'm not gonna go over them in any detail. Um, if you find you, yourself needing or wanting to do things with unique lines in some sort, some form or other, have a look at the man pages, see what it does. See whether you can basically make the command do something that you need. Something I've sort of glossed over before when I went over flags and arguments, but I, I've sort of sneakily introduced with the dash small e and pattern flag is flags can have arguments and some flags can have mandatory arguments. So if you specify the flag, you also have to specify its argument. And then the order is as you'd expect. So if you provide a short flag, you then immediately after that, with or without a space, you don't necessarily need the space there, um, provide its argument. The second command there, dash IE, I'm trying to show is that you can do um, short flag arguments and just, so, short flags and you can 
couple the short flags as he always would. But if one of them has an argument, then that needs to come immediately after the mention of that short flag. So maybe in some cases you can't couple or can't compress all of the short flags because multiple of them have arguments then you take them apart. I notice if you do said dash EI script, then well, because the script comes with the E, not the I, it gets confused and it'll throw an error, basically. Or should anyway. And then to compare with that, if you specify a long form argument instead with double dash, you introduce the, the argument that comes after or the, the argument that belongs with that flag with an equal sign. So said double dash expression equals script is the same thing functionally as said dash e script. A couple of final bits to connect some dots. So you might need to use bash in order to connect to a cluster. So basically logging into the cluster is done with SSH, that's secure socket shell. Um, I can't exactly give you a, a, a sample command because I don't have an SSH server running public. Um, so find at some point when, when you need it, you know, the address of your uni cluster or whatever cluster you're working with or your second machine that you're running headless or and the SSH into it. You may need to specify the name. So SSH name at means use that username to log in with. If you set things up nicely with your working environment, your username on your local PC is the same as the username on the cluster. And then you don't need to specify the name because that username is usually, or is used by default, right? And usually what happens with SSH is you're challenged to a password or in some cases you might have, have had to deposit a public key. I'm not going to go into that, but there's almost certainly going to be guidance about how to do that. And since you now know how to write commands, basic uh, commands in, in bash, you should be able to follow that tutorial quite easily. The other thing you can do over SSH is you can copy files. So there's this command SCP, which is secure copy, which works pretty much exactly like copy, except you can specify remote paths. So your secure shell host, or as when I write remote host here, I mean, mean something like your uni, uni cluster URL. And then the way this works is the remote host entry point is presumably the home folder. So your user folder in, on the cluster. And that's where you where you start off from. I don't think, I, I might be wrong, but I don't think you can start from root. So usually it start from your user directory and then copy things from to there onto your local machine or, so you can copy from local to um, remote or from remote to local or even from one remote host to another remote host. So just to sort of to patch things over, which, well, CP on its own doesn't do networked copying, but SCP does. A few nifty tricks just to, to wrap things up. Um, Depending on what your keyboard layout is, the backtick might be top left somewhere just under the, underneath the escape key. 
um, you can use that to execute a command and put the output into whatever the rest of the command that you're writing. So let me write this ls slash, uh, sorry, ls slash home slash backtick who am I, backtick slash. You're effectively doing ls slash home slash your username slash, which in this case isn't useful, but in some cases it might be if you have your username and some other path related things, for example. And of course you can use other commands instead of who am I, but generally you'll be using those. Uh, so using backticks as um, things where it's easier to get the output of like a single line, uh, single line output than to type the whole thing in. Double ampersand is a way to chain commands. So you can do command one and command two to say run the first command and then run the second command. Effectively, actually you could use it to, to do proper shell scripting, which I'm not gonna go into. But at least I usually use it to, to run things like um, update my package manager and do the upgrades in one go. So it basically just shortens the number of hitting enter and babysitting the, the terminal that you have to do in longer commands. If the first one fails, the whole thing fails. So there's no um, worry of command two running if command one had a mistake. One thing I find useful recently is um, running a, things in a subshell. So with round brackets, you can open a subshell. So I've been working with, uh, in, so I, I've got my working directory somewhere and I've got my, I don't know, Git um, repository somewhere. And I'm from my working directory, I can open in a subshell, pop over into the uh, git directory to a git pull or a git whatever and close the bracket and I'm still in the working directory so it doesn't change where I am sort of runs it next to where I am anyway it's useful to sort of reduce the number of either push these or cds or such that you have to do The final one that I've used quite a bit when, when trying things is touch. So actually the, the original idea of it is you change the, the, I believe without anything, it's access timestamp. So each file in, in Linux has a couple of timestamps for access creation modification. Um, and touch changes the timestamp, but if the file doesn't exist, that you're touching, then that file is created. So it's a good way of, of just creating empty files to try things with. A couple of things where you can go next. So when you use bash quite a bit, you notice sometimes there are commands that, you, that are kind of awkward to write, that are kind of long, and you use them a lot. It might be useful to set up an alias for them. So the first part of this command here, so alias name equals something, sets it at a local level. So you can open a shell, run alias something, and it's so it's valid until you close that shell. If you put it into the bash RC file in your home directory, then it sticks around. So next time you open bash, um, that 
script is actually executed, the bashrc file. So your aliases are, if they're in there, they're always available. And then something that I'm not going to go into because, well, in the interest of time and it's not really the scope of this tutorial, I'm not gonna go into scripting, but basically to say bash is Turing complete, you could write entire, or can and people do write entire programs with it. Um, whether it's useful is another question, whether it's good for your sanity is a, another question, um, but you can do it and sometimes it is useful. Um, so you, if you just have a, a text file with commands in them, you can run them with bash and the text file. And if you want to run them more often, or if you have a script that you find particularly useful that you actually want to have sticking around, then prefacing it. So in, on the first line, putting hash bang slash bin bash or slash bin shell, I should say slash bin sh, I guess. Um, and then running chmod that plus x, that means you change the, the file mode from being not executable to being executable, then you can just run it from either from the current directory or if you put it in some somewhere on your path. I haven't explained that, but that's for another time. Um, then you can run your script from, from anywhere. Of course, there's a lot of stuff that I haven't covered. Um, I've got a few links in uh, the chat and I found this one here that I'm linking from the slides quite useful as an overview of what's there. Um, it's basically, a, a, well, yeah, online man pages. And yeah, from my side, the most important thing if you, want to become proficient in using bash is use bash. Nothing is more important than practice, even man page reading, it's, it's useful to, to get an overview of what's there, but it can only get you so far and you need to have some experience, some um, exposure to actually using commands in order to be able to fully understand what the man pages are even talking about sometimes. Playing around is usually safe, so unless you're playing with dangerous commands of some sort or another. But anyway, if you're doing that, use a temporary directory or something, do the usual things to not lose any data or lose your system or whatever. It's not a nifty bit that I should have put in the nifty bits. Um, commands that are potentially very harmful that you don't want to have in history if you're randomly tapping the error up key um, and keep them out of history entirely. If you just put a space in front of it, it'll still run as normal, but it won't be uh, entered into history. And that's it from my side. Um, I invite you to ask questions. We've got another half hour. And um, Shailesh has put together a feedback form, Shailesh or Anchor, anyway, um, which you're more than welcome to uh, fill out and give some feedback about how this session was, how you found it, whether you've taken something from it. And yeah, so with that from my side, that's all. Thank you all for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Oh, thank you so much, Felix. I've uh, I've been using uh, Terminal for like a decade now, like you, but a lot of this stuff I hadn't uh, really heard of before. So I'm going to try to incorporate some of these things into my workflow. So thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Okay.
this. Oh. Just put in the link for the um, feedback form in the chat. Anchor, do you want to take that one? I I know Ock, but I I'm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Ock is kind of a language in itself, and so you have the Ock command, which acts as the interpreter. But you can write whole programs in Ock, and it has its own syntax, and it is. Um, um, it's it's a lot more advanced than said, obviously, because it has a whole language of itself. But yeah, it is very very useful to um, for string operations where you want to only print certain bits of strings or you want to uh, replace things. Um, and the advantage is that um, said, since it's a stream editor, it will only do one pass over your file, right? So something comes in, said does all its operations, and you get an output. You you don't. I don't think said can even do a second pass, right? It's not made for that. You need to uh, save the output of one and then run set again on it and so on. So it's a single pass operation. Whereas with awk, you can have four loops and you can go do multiple passes of your data and so on and run different operations. Uh, yeah, it's, it's. I think nowadays awk is very rarely used. At one point, it was one of the important tools that I think system administrators would use to parse the log files and gather information and so on. But I think nowadays most people would end up using Python or Perl or something of that sort, which is which has a, I guess, a cleaner interface, right? And you can write scripts. So OK, yeah, OK is, I mean, if using the command line is considered um, slightly, let's say, technical, then OK becomes a few levels above <laughs> using the <laughs> command line. Yeah, I, I, I think I've, I've used OK from time to time only when I couldn't get set to do something. But that means you've spent enough hours trying to figure out a regular expression for said and have failed. And then you go and dig into awk and then try something there. Uh, generally, you end up on Stack Exchange or some other discussion site, which explains how to do things very well in awk. But it, it's not something that we, that well, I haven't, that I um, use commonly nowadays. Yeah. Um, Felix, since we have time left, do you want to quickly share the Software Working Group's website and we can encourage people to join us, to join the community and do more? Sure, just a sec. Oh, there we are. So um, all we really want to say is that um, the software working group is completely open for everybody to join. Um, you don't have to be a postdoc. You don't have to be faculty. In fact, uh, we we really want more and more students to join in because um, they are people that have more time than most people to tinker with things and then be able to share it and you know discuss. Um, there is no membership fee uh, because we are shared by the INCF and OCNS. It is sufficient if you're a member of either, but it's not something we uh, we check. We are open, we are on GitHub. Um, everything happens transparently. We have no secret mailing lists or so on. Um, literally, so all the discussion happens on GitHub. So if you go on our website that you can see here, it's ocns.github.io slash software working group. 
uh, you should find all the information you need. Um, and yeah, so it's, it is a working group because that's the term that we use in academia when we form, uh, when groups of people get together to do something. But basically it's just a community of people who, um, who like to tinker with software in whatever form, could be bash, could be a programming language, could be continuous integration, or it could be as simple as just scripting in Python, right, for daily work. And the point is that we have this common interest and we would like um, to, able, to be able to share knowledge that we all have, right? So we all work on very specific tasks and we come up with lots of things that others may not be aware. For example, Felix here has shared a lot of knowledge about Bash in the command line. Uh, we have two more tutorials today and tomorrow where we'll share more, more information. But join the group if you have um, a project in mind or a task in mind, discuss it with people. Uh, other people who are interested will join you and you can do it on your own. We will help you get the infrastructure, right? That is where linking to INCF and OCNS becomes important because when we do need resources, we can ask these two bodies for resources. Yeah, but apart from that, um, at the moment we've done some developer sessions where we talk about how uh, some of the software that we use quite frequently is developed. Again, the idea is that people should have some awareness of what goes into developing these softwares. Uh, and we'd like to encourage more people to contribute to these tools, right? Because um, the more contributors they are, the safer these softwares are in the long term. So that is the idea. Join us, come say hello whenever you want. Um, if you have an idea, just put it forward and we'll discuss it and we'll get it done. And yeah, attend our sessions and let us know if there's anything you think we can do better or something we haven't considered that we should take on. Uh, yeah, if there are any other working group folks here, you want to say anything, just go ahead. I think it's all good. I th um, so we just hope we find, uh, int uh, I mean, you all found this interesting and that we see you in these other two tutorials as well. One is in uh, after two and a half hours taken by Ankur about Git. And tomorrow we have um, a session on Python, Python for beginners. So yeah, we hope to see you all there. And I think we can close the session now. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think we're down to something like uh, seven participants. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess we're just talking right. to ourselves now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks again, Felix. That was great. We'll see you guys in a couple hours here. Yeah. Yeah. See ya. Thanks. Thanks very much, Felix. Thanks. <laughs>